A day in the life of a private practice psychiatrist. Welcome to my vlog, my first one. This is a day in the life of a private practice psychiatrist. My name is Alana Miller. I'm an integrative psychiatrist in Los Angeles. I also teach and mentor psychiatrists and psych MPs on how to build integrative psychiatry private practices. I'm just gonna show you what my typical day is like. Now to start, we're gonna go back in time a couple hours to when I woke up this morning. Good morning, I just woke up. I'm doing this literally day of my life. Just woke up, it's about 7 a.m. Normally I do not talk to anyone until I've had coffee, so let's do that first. Much better. Okay, so first thing that I do in the morning after getting my cup of coffee is I write. I am writing a book, a memoir about my experience surviving cancer, and I have been working on it for a really long time and just was not being consistent about writing and found that the only time I would consistently write is if I forced myself to do it first thing in the morning. So I literally do nothing else until I've written at least 500 to 1,000 words. Maybe it takes me 30, 45 minutes, something like that. Sometimes Rascal joins me. You can see he has no respect for my personal space, but I love him. Next thing I do after writing is I hit my home gym. This is another thing that I just have to get done first thing in the morning because if I don't, I won't do it, and that's exercise. I just feel so much better mentally, emotionally, physically, everything if I exercise. Sometimes my husband's out there joining me. I'm really trying to get in shape, so sometimes I'm doing weightlifting in addition to just like cardio type stuff. I'm really into Peter Atia's whole uh, longevity blueprint stuff in terms of weightlifting and VO2 max training, so that's what I've been working on. Next, off to the bathroom, take a shower. Not going to show you that, obviously. Now, I got started a little bit late this morning. My first patient's not till 10. I usually start around 9 or 10. So I had some time to make an actual breakfast. And I've been really leaning into the Mediterranean diet recently. So I have this egg toast that I make with roasted eggplant on the side and had some little quality time with raggy in there. I just want you to notice when this comes out of the oven, how quickly my husband shows up. Coincidence? I, I think not. There he is. I always make three pieces of egg toast because he'll eat one of them and that way I get my two. There it is, final product. Plate myself up some food. Then off to my office to start seeing patients. It's a converted bedroom in my house. I've got this great view of the street that I look out on when I work, which is very nice. There's the chair where the magic happens. And now I'm just gonna be doing some emails, eating my breakfast, waiting till that first patient is ready to go, I'm changing to something a little bit more work appropriate. Okay, so I'm not gonna show you me actually seeing patients, obviously, HIPAA, patient privacy and all that. Just to give you a sense of what my patient schedule is like, I practice integrative psychiatry, which is not alternative psychiatry. It's a very important distinction. I practice standard of care psychiatry with extras that are generally low risk and complementary to standard of care approaches. I do a lot of psychotherapy. So because psychotherapy appointments are longer and you generally see psychotherapy patients more frequently, I would say the majority of my day is psychotherapy with med management that I do with those patients that I'm doing psychotherapy with and maybe a couple med management appointments. So if you were to look at my entire patient panel, probably two thirds of my patient panel is med management, but because I'm seeing those patients less frequently. My actual day is mostly psychotherapy, which I really enjoy. And I would say just in general, I really love my clinical practice. I love practicing integrative psychiatry. I love that I have tools to pull on besides just medication, using evidence-informed nutraceuticals, doing psychotherapy, mind-body approaches, functional lab testing, and really focusing on my relationship with the patient, really offering personalized relationship-based care. So it's very, very fulfilling for me. So I just finished with my first couple of patients of the day. It's around noon right now. And if I were to tell you what I love the absolute best about being in private practice, it's having total autonomy over my schedule. So I work when I want to work. I see the kinds of patients I want to see. I work the kind of hours I want to work. If I want to take vacation, I take vacation. But I would say with that level of autonomy comes a certain level of responsibility too, right? Meaning that if I take vacation, I don't get paid. If I take vacation, 
medication, I have to make sure there's coverage for my patients. Or I, you know, check my email once a day and cover. If I have a patient that's difficult or pushing boundaries, I have to be able to work with that situation and work with that patient and solve it. I don't have any supervisor who's gonna come in and rescue me. If there's any kind of business or systems problem I'm having, I'm the one who caused it because I set up all the business systems, but I can solve it then too. So I would say private practice probably lends itself to people who really, really like autonomy and like having that level of control and are willing to have that level of responsibility that comes with crafting the kind of life and day that they want and the kind of practice that they want. For those of you wondering about my pre and post appointment workflow, it's pretty straightforward. I'll let you know what it is. Essentially prior to patient appointments, I'll log into my EHR at least five minutes beforehand, just review the chart, take notes in my notebook in terms of what I discussed with that patient last time, what I need to make sure to ask them today, and then do the appointment afterward. My immediate workflow is one, just make sure the patient is scheduled for their follow-up and make sure to put it into my calendar so that slot is blocked. And then I log into my EHR and the billing software I use to make sure the appointment billed and went through. And then if I'm on top of it, I write the note at that point, but I'm often not on top of it. And sometimes I delay writing the notes till maybe like the end of the week. Basically, I write all of my notes or I take notes with patients during the appointment itself. And then I write them in these notebooks. I've got like, a gazillion of these five-star notebooks. And then afterward, I transfer into them into my EHR. But because I've got the paper notes, at least if I don't write the note till, you know, the end of the week, I, I still remember things. Now, as you know, in private practice, two things. One, time is money. And number two, it's all on you, right? Because presumably you don't have a whole staff of people working for you that are taking care of your admin. So you need to be extremely efficient with your admin. And I feel like I've got this very much covered. I use Intake Q for my EHR. I mean, actually, honestly, I use Luminello for charting because when I started my practice in 2017, I felt Luminello was the best EHR that I could find. But now I really think Intake Q is better. So I've switched basically everything over to Intake Q with the exception of charting, but I do all my scheduling, billing, intake forms in Intake Q, and then just upload things as needed into Luminello. It sounds like a hassle. It's really not that much of a hassle. Now with Intake Q, it allows me to really automate so many of my system. So in terms of billing, for example, as part of my intake forms, I collect credit card authorizations that automatically goes into a patient's profile in intake queue. And then at the time of the appointment, or you can set it to do before, or after, whatever you want, it bills the patient according to the fee schedule I set into intake queue in their profile. So all I have to do is log in and make sure the credit card went through and everything worked as it was supposed to, which it pretty much always does. Now a mistake I see people making in private practice is thinking in terms of the admin, the first step is to hire someone else to do it for you. Outsourcing should be the last step you consider after you do the first two steps, which are one, eliminate. If you have an admin task, the first thing is to think, can you just not do this task? Can you get rid of it? I'll give you a really quick example. Initially in my practice, I had an after hours phone line and it makes sense, right? Sometimes patients might need to call you after hours, but it was never used appropriately. Honestly, not once. It was meant to be like an established patient with a reasonable reason to call me, calling me after hours. And it was never that. It was like, I mean, honestly, it was sometimes people who weren't even my patients, who just heard it on my voicemail and just wanted to talk to me sooner. It was patients who had missed multiple appointments then just contacting me on the weekend. Oh, I want that out of in refill from you right now because I couldn't come to that appointment we had scheduled earlier in the week. And it was just driving me totally insane. And so the first thought I had was, oh, maybe I can hire an answering service. But then I'm like, no, I just, can I just get rid of this after hours number? And I did the research, I talked to my malpractice. There was no reason for me to need an after hours number in terms of liability, as long as I explained to patients that I didn't have it and what they needed to do if they had an issue after hours. So I just got rid of that and it solved so many problems. So number one, you eliminate tasks if you can. Number two, if you can't eliminate them, you automate them. So for example, billing. I don't outsource any of my billing. I don't hire someone else to do it. I just have a very efficient software system, Intake Q, do it automatically. And then I just kind of oversee to make sure it's working. Now only if you can't 
eliminate a task and then you also can't automate a task with a software, then do you consider outsourcing it by hiring? But really for most solo private practice clinicians, I really don't think that that's necessary. Okay, so normally at this point of the day, I would get lunch. Now I had kind of a late breakfast and a big breakfast, so I'm not that hungry. Usually I really only eat either breakfast or lunch. I don't eat both. Now look, working from home has its pros and cons certainly, but I for myself feel like the pros massively outweigh the cons and the biggest pro is having your kitchen completely accessible to you at all times. Okay, so now I'm gonna hit up my fridge for some snacks. Um, zeroed in on these grapes here, love grapes. I also really love salty snacks. For some reason, I always crave salty snacks, so I'm getting this olive oil popcorn from Trader Joe's. Heading over to my couch. Now let me straight up tell you the pros and cons of working from home. Pro, kitchen access, like you just saw. Pro, I roll out of bed, do my morning routine, and start seeing patients. I don't have to worry about any kind of commute. Pro, I'm about to watch a little bit of TV. I personally like that. For me, watching a little bit of TV in the middle of the day is a nice break. Con, so when I lived in a one bedroom apartment and not a house, it was kind of hard to work. Obviously, my husband couldn't be there, and we just got this house a year and a half ago or so, so it's not been that long. I've actually been working from home since before the pandemic because I had my stem cell transplant in October 2019. My cancer relapsed in August. I had my stem cell transplant a few months later. And so I was super immunocompromised and I had to go to video. Well, first I just full on took three months off while I had that transplant. Then I was recovering, wanted to start seeing patients again, but I did not have the okay for my oncologist to really be out in public at all. And so I had to work from home and it was a bit of a harder sell at that point, explaining to patients like, sorry, I can't see you in person anymore. But then COVID happened and then the whole world switched to video and honestly it kind of made my life a little bit easier because that's already what I was doing. Now you could say a con of working from home is that you could feel lonely. I will tell you sincerely I don't feel lonely at all. I really like it. So one, I'm a bit of an introvert, so I kind of like being in my own space and having my own comforts close by. But two, even when I'm seeing patients over video, I do feel a connection, so I don't feel alone in those moments. And having my mentorship program, which has got I think about 120 people in it now and it's growing every month. You know, when I do my Q&A calls, when I'm logging onto the forum and answering people's questions, I feel a connection with all of those colleagues. And so I do feel like my life is very rich in terms of my day to day. I don't feel lonely. Now, one thing I will say about working from home is that because I don't have to leave my house to go to work and I really only have to leave to run occasional errands and often it's my husband who's doing the grocery shopping, I could very easily not be leaving my house ever if I didn't go out of my way to exercise and run errands and just like be social. What kind of TV am I watching? I'm glad you asked. Look, let me be honest with you. If I want to learn something or be mentally stimulated, I'll read a book. If I want to be mindlessly entertained, I'll watch TV. So I watch really just trash reality TV. Actually right now I'm watching the ultimatum queer edition. I do not like Vanessa. I do not like how she is treating Xander at all. So after a couple of minutes of watching TV, needing my snacks, back to my office to see my afternoon patients. Just an honest side note to tell you as I'm recording this is I feel honestly embarrassed at how messy my house is. And this is me after having cleaned it, knowing I was gonna be recording this video, but I'm just not very good at maintaining a clean home. I'm really Good at business. I'm not good at being a housewife, so sue me. Now seeing a couple of afternoon patients. Okay, so it's a couple minutes before 5 p.m. right now. I'm gonna show you something that doesn't happen every day, but happens every two weeks, and that is the bi-weekly Q&A call I do for my career mentorship program. So I'm gonna show you a couple of clips from it. You can get like an insider view of what these calls are like. You'll see we discuss a variety of topics, everything from clinical questions, especially regarding integrative psychiatry, to business systems, systems questions, how to optimize your business systems in private practice to business strategy, which is where I really shine, where I really enjoy coaching people on the marketing strategies to be successful for getting patients in a cash pay private practice. So yeah, let's check it out. Hey there. 
just gonna let people in. Hey Ben, good to see you. But maybe and I, I can start with your questions. Actually, that's perfect timing. Maybe you can share a little bit about this patient. He's stage four colon cancer. You're doing therapy with him. He wants help setting goals. So just, yeah, tell me a little bit about him. And how, and how long ago did this, did he like first present to the ER and like, okay, so it's not been that long. Uh, okay. So here are my thoughts. I mean, I, I almost identify a lot with this patient, you know, I, I have like a similar mindset and really like in a, in a situation like this, there's two kind of competing interests, but they, they are not necessarily competing. One is enjoying what remains of one's life. And the other is making progress and acting as if one's going to live for a long period of time. And those two things may be the same for a type A type of person. They may be happy only if they're feeling like they're making progress. Obviously one can easily think like, oh, this person's just in denial, but I don't think necessarily, because I'm like this way myself, setting goals, you know, makes me happy. And I didn't have a great prognosis when I relapsed and I had to get the stem cell transplant. It was like a 50-50 at best. It was like flipping a coin, but I kept working and it was like the only thing that really kept me sane. And so I would just take his desire to set these goals just at face value. Yeah, let's do this. So background for everyone, Agam has a very specific niche working with young adult men, kind of failure to launch, video game addiction, gamers in particular, and all the kind of problems that come along with potentially video game addiction. So he made a page that I gave him feedback on at the last call, a package essentially of services that he would, he would offer to a potential patient. And it was very much written in language to attract the niche, like the young adult men. And so I suggested for him, make a specific page for parents that speaks in their language to their concerns so that you do both. You have language that appeals to the niche, but language that appeals to the parents since the parents are essentially the customer. And so he did this page and he posted it on the forum asking for my feedback. And I just thought you like totally 100% nailed it. It's so good. And let me just go through and explain why, because it could be useful for others. Yeah, totally. It's, it's super fun. So yeah, it, I was just really happy watching, seeing that page you did. I thought you did a great job. Oh, hey, how are you doing? Okay, so I know you had a question on your niche. Tell me a little bit about what you were, were thinking. Okay, yeah, I see. And we gave you feedback to be a little bit more specific. So what I would say is that with a USP, it's true, the more narrow you go, ultimately you can charge more, but you will grow slower. In the beginning, I think realistically, a private practice is gonna be a lot of bread and butter psych. It's gonna be a lot of like anxiety and depression, trauma, some ADHD, some bipolar disorder. You don't need to be really narrow in every way, but you wanna be specific in at least one way. You can narrow in, in multiple ways. One is narrowing down in terms of demographic factors that would be like age gender occupation so for example working with women versus men working with children versus young adults versus adults versus older people versus um I work with high achieving professionals or working professionals. So those are all ways that you can niche down young to middle aged. That's decent enough. You want to work with men and women both right you ultimately will not be that narrow in terms of demographic factors. I mean, you, it's somewhat narrowed down in terms of age, but I think what, when I saw your USP, what was missing is you could narrow down on the psychographics. So if you're, if you're being broad with demographics, you should at least be narrow with psychographics. And psychographics are how a person thinks. In particular, in an integrative practice, how do people think that want to see an integrative clinician? Usually, they want to get to the root cause of the issue or they want a holistic approach. They don't want to just depend on medication. These are all not demographic identifiers, but they are psychographic identifiers that you can speak to in a unique selling proposition. I hope everyone has a good rest of your evening and I'll see you guys soon on the next call. Bye everyone. All right, just finished my Q&A call. It's like 6.30, a little after 6.30. So these calls are scheduled for an hour and a half, but sometimes they go late. You know, I essentially stay as long as I need to to make sure I've answered everyone's questions. Time for dinner. Thankfully, my husband got us some pokey. All right, now I'm gonna dig into this pokey here. It's from this local place near us called the Pokey Bar, which is really good. Sit outside in our garden, eating the pokey, enjoying the 
Nice weather. Now, I swear to God, my husband isn't intentionally just stealing food from me there. We mutually agreed we would share one pokey. Just kind of nice to enjoy the, the garden after a, a solid day of work. Now, my husband came and said he wanted to take the cats for a walk. So that's why I followed him with the camera. This is Raggy. Sometimes he will walk with them down the block. I, it's a whole thing. Now, just gonna enjoy the rest of the evening watching a little TV. Watched Tom Segura's new comedy special. It was pretty funny. Some really random movie also with Natalie Portman called Annihilation I think was on Netflix it was weird I'm not sure if I recommend it or not yeah just chilling all right so it's around nine o'clock this is kind of around when I get into bed I don't actually fall asleep this early but I like to get into bed and then spend a couple hours reading before I fall asleep so I feel like I'm kind of slurring right now because I have my Invisalign retainer in I <laughs> literally it is night and I'm about to <laughs> tuck in for my evening routine but just showing you very re realistically what my evening is like so I got my um, Kindle here I'm sorry, it's an iPad, but I read on my, the Kindle app on my iPad. I used to be really into literary fiction. I kind of feel slightly ashamed of myself. I don't read as much literary fiction as I used to, but I do read a lot of nonfiction, especially business books. I'm just going to pull this up. What are the last, like, five books I've read? Currently reading The 10X Rule by Grant Cardone. Before that, Snow Leopard, How Legendary Writers Create a Category of One. Seth Godin's new book, The Song of Significance. I um, hired a couple people, so I was reading some books about hiring a team and being a good manager. 10x is easier than 2x. As you see, I'm into the 10x thing right now. Dan Martell, Buy Back Your Time. Actually, that is a highly, highly recommended book if you are thinking about outsourcing. I know I said earlier in this very vlog that outsourcing, delegating, like hiring someone should be the absolute last step in the sequence of events. First you automate and then you delegate. But if you are going to hire, read that book, Buy Back Your Time. It explains very well how you should be hiring for buying back your time rather than hiring for a role. Really identifying what are the tasks that take up most of your day that are low yield and figuring out how to outsource those. Then uh, Bigger Than You, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Building an Unstoppable Team. I was randomly reading this book called The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. I read a lot about the Holocaust for some reason. 5,000 Words Per Hour by Chris Fox. 2,000 to 10,000. How to Write Fast to Write Better and write more of what you love. I'm writing a book, as you saw, and I was, I'm trying to just write more efficiently, write faster, more effectively. So anyway, those are the last nine books. There's a lot more in here. I mean, those are just books I've read in the last couple of weeks. I read a lot. So um, that's how I know a lot, I guess. All right, so now I'm just gonna tuck in, read my... 10x rule book for an hour and then that's it for me that's my night before i turn off this camera for the night i was just thinking as i've been recording this over the course of the day how my day might be perceived by someone else since you know presumably there's going to be some people watching this i don't know how does this look to someone who has a job or someone who has a different kind of schedule as a psychiatrist i'm a bit far removed from the world of jobs because i've had my own practice for so long and i would say that on one hand i wonder if it would seem like I don't work that hard. I mean, I would say to a certain extent that's true. I work very smart, but I don't work crazy hours or anything like that. But I, I would say I work six days a week. I see patients four days a week. I only see patients Monday through Thursday. Friday, I work on other business stuff. Saturday, the day of rest, I usually go hiking. And although I still write on Saturdays, I write seven days a week. And then Sunday, honestly, I'm usually working most of the day. So I don't work that hard in any given day but I'm very strategic about the work that I do do and I do work six days even though I don't have to work that much. I personally love what I do. I don't need to earn any more money than I do. I don't work that hard because I need to earn more money. I genuinely find a lot of fulfillment in building things and creating things. I mean making videos like this, having my mentorship program, growing my practice, helping my patients. I love learning and studying so I find my life very fulfilling and what I would say is even if you feel like my my day is how you wouldn't want to live your day. The benefit of a private practice, if it's something you're considering, is that you can set up your day literally however you want. So a lot of people go into private practice thinking, oh, I can make, I can work the same as I'm working now and make double. And that's true. You do make probably around double per hour in private practice as you do in a job. However, what I found now coaching like a hundred people, there's over a hundred people in my mentorship program, I've observed a very clear pattern, which is that once 
once people g match their past full-time income, usually around with half-time work, they don't want to work any more than that. That's enough money for them, for their expenses, to feed their families or whatever it is. And they just want to enjoy the rest of their free time to do whatever it is. For me, I fill that free time with writing and exercise and my mentorship program. For you, you can do whatever you want with that free time. And that's the glorious thing. If you're interested in learning more about my mentorship program or about just what I offer, check out the link in the description. And I'll, I'll link to a couple of resources and also a couple of my other YouTube videos you might find interesting. So have a good evening. I'll see you there.